Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this session E1, optimizing the medication pathway, meeting the WHO target of 50% fewer medication errors and clearing patient backlogs through automation. Kieran Walsh is my name, I'm clinical director at BMJ and I'm delighted to be chairing this session. I'm also delighted that this session has been sponsored by Becton Dickinson, who are working in this area. So a warm welcome to Becton Dickinson also. Medication errors can result in many challenges for both healthcare workers and patients alike. But with modern technology, medication management can result in more efficiency and standardization. In this session, you learn how automa automation and digitalization along the medication pathway can help clear patient backlogs, reduce length of stay, and boost staff efficiency. I'm excited to introduce a great panel who are going to speak to these subjects. They include Anders Westermark, MD Project Lead of Safe and Efficient Pharmaceuticals Chain, Uppsala University Hospital, Sweden. Rachel Elliott, Professor of Health Economics at the Manchester Centre for Health Economics, UK. Johan Hellings, CEO AZ Delta and Senior Lecturer of Patient Safety, Hassel University, Belgium. Mike Fairborn, Patient Safety Chair at the Association of British Health Tech Industries, VP and General Manager at BD UK and Ireland, and John Dean, Clinical Lead for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at the Royal College of Physicians and Deputy Medical Director of East Lancashire Hospitals NHS Trust. So let's start with Rachel and then John, who are going to speak to the current situation. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for inviting me to come to this. Um, I'm really excited to be able to listen to the other speakers. I suppose I'm kicking off with um, a little bit of scene setting. Um, just going to um, sort of talk a little bit about the, um, the sort of the, the sort of economic impact really of of uh, medication errors. Um, we did some work recently for the um, Department of Health and Social Care in England, and we estimated that in a year that there were. Um, 230 to 40 million errors um, across the medicines use process, across all the settings, primary, secondary care and, um, and, and nursing care homes. And, um, and, and of this, um, these 237 million errors, um, obviously there are limitations to that estimate. Um, this uh, led to um, an increase in 181,000 bed days as well, and caused or contributed to between 712 and 1,700 deaths, costing the NHS um, just under 100 million pounds. That is a conservative estimate. We also did some variations which increased the estimates up quite a lot. So looking at um, sort of automation of medication in secondary care, then about 20% of those errors did actually occur in secondary care. And, um, and of those, um, probably 59% um, of prescribing errors were classed as moderate or severe, i.e. would likely to be causing harm. So therefore you'd want to avoid uh, about 14% of dispensing errors about 7% of administration errors, and, or, and then about 89% of monitoring errors. And on top of that, about 24 and a half million was paid out by NHS resolution in, 19, in 2019 to 20 for medication errors. And, um, and so looking at the burden of, um, of economic, uh, of errors, is actually um, what we're interested in because the World Health Organization has actually asked um, uh, nations to reduce their harm caused by errors by 50%. Um, and this means that we need to be able to focus in on the on the errors that are important, that cause harm to patients and associated increased resource use um, for, for healthcare. And just to give you an example, um, um, some work that was done in the UK recently suggested that um, over a third of people over 65 who were discharged from hospital um, experienced some sort of medication related harm in the next um, eight weeks and three quarters of those were due to prescription issued in secondary care and of those patients three quarters required further care either a GP appointment an A&E um, visit 
an outpatient or an outpatient visit. So therefore, we have got um, quite a big issue here in terms of burden. But it's quite difficult to measure that harm. And I think the other thing that is important to remember is that we can only really we need to understand what is preventable. So we need to focus our efforts on where there's most harm, but also where that harm is preventable. I'm going to stop there and uh, and hand over. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so what uh, I'd like us to do is just think through medicines use in hospital uh, and the potential for error and harm. But uh, importantly, as Rachel says, the the uh, prevention, the, the potential for error prevention. So let's think about uh, a patient pathway. I'm going to use um, an emergency pathway as an example. So the patient may be uh, uh, in, initially assessed by uh, ambulance staff in their home, and that should include uh, their medicines and hopefully bringing their medicines uh, to hospital with them. Um, then they might be in an emergency department uh, where there may be no uh, storage facility uh, for their own medicines. Uh, there may be delays in when they would normally receive medicines, and they may receive new medicines and treatments uh, that, that need to be uh, appropriate for their uh, acute condition in the context of any other conditions. Um, then they may move to an assessment unit where there may be a more detailed assessment of their clinical condition and a reconciliation of the medicines that are being prescribed there with the medicines uh, that we need to understand they've been taking before they come into hospital and that needs a detailed interaction. But their condition may have changed. Around one in 10 acute medical admissions will have a uh, deterioration in their kidney function, which, which will alter uh, their, their, their medication uh, needs and, and how we monitor those. Uh, a large number will have medicines by infusion during that acu acute phase. Um, and then if they stay in hospital, they may move to another ward environment. If they're a surgical patient, they may go to theatre. And again, there are ongoing care and monitoring needs on the effect of the medication on their condition. And then again, has been highlighted their discharge from hospital and there's a further transfer of information and there are large error rates there. But let's think about the medicines process then, because that has a number of features. Um, we prescribe or we may de-prescribe when the patient is in hospital with an acute condition. There then needs to be a timely supply of the right medicines, either the patient's own medicines or medicines that are supplied by the hospital. There needs to be administration at the right time by the right route at the right dose uh, and ensure that happens reliably, particularly for critical medicines at critical times. And then there needs to be adequate monitoring of the effect and potential side effects of those. But there's a change in control, particularly with some critical medicines, where outside hospital patients are in control of the timing, the dose, how that links to other elements that they're doing, such as eating, for example, or movement or time of the day. And yet often that control is removed from them and fits into a hospital routine rather than the patient's routine. Then let's think about risk. Let's think about where are the highest risks. So we may have high risk medicines, which may have a, a narrow therapeutic window, may have a high side effect profile uh, uh, or, or, or again, uh, maybe, maybe time critical. We have high risk patients due to their uh, ongoing, their medical condition, be that uh, renal or, or, or kidney dysfunction, for, for, for example, they have multiple conditions, they have multiple medications, they're particularly sick and vulnerable at that time. And then we have high-risk context, context, so a busy, a busy department, a situation where medicines need to be given quickly, we need to be monitoring the effects quickly, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we may have other factors going on with that patient care or, or within that department. So we know, for example, that the, the biggest reason for patients not being detected when they deteriorate is because another patient is sick and requiring care at that time. Then we need to think about cause and effect. So the cause of an error or harm may occur at one part of that pathway, but it might be detected elsewhere and the effects may happen at a later stage. So we need to be identifying both potential cause uh, detection and, and, and their error prevention. And then finally, uh, if there are errors, we need to think about a systems approach because these will be system errors. And what are the key elements of the system we need to consider? What about the human behaviours and the behaviour of the team? What about the knowledge of the different team members or their technical skills? 
What about the equipment that's used uh, to, to, to supply or administer or monitor the medicines? What about the physical environment and the cultural environment in which that sits? And how is that system designed, both, both the fixed design uh, that needs to be worked with and that should be uh, at low risk, but also the adaptive design so that that can change at times. So I hope what I've done is painted a picture for you of a patient coming into hospital and the potential for error, uh, uh, the potential for harm, but also the potential for error prevention. And I'm going to hand on to our next speaker. Thanks, John and, and, and Rachel. So let's um, move on quickly to Johan and Anders and implementing autom automation. Uh, Johan, uh, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. So improving the safety of uh, the medication pathway is uh, challenging, not by the lack of knowledge in doing what or how, but by the lack of professional implementation in developing a safe, integrated system. And, in, and the support of professionals working in such a system. The integrated perspective needs to be underlined. That's the key point in, uh, for my message in this session. The target is well known, and uh, John described it uh, a minute ago. The right med medicine for the right patient from the right route in the right time and in the right dose. This can only be guaranteed in a comprehensive system focusing on structure, process, and culture. I will explain it further. In developing the right structure, the key role will be an integrated electronic patient record system. This will be the crucial backbone, I think, in connecting information with technology, supporting the professionals. All clinical information of the patient needs to be integrated in such a system. So the physician can start with the prescribing from the computerized physician order entry. And there is, of course, intelligence in that system, helping the, the, the physician with the prescribing and preventing of errors. For example, giving alerts by specific drug interactions. The potential of this growing intelligence in prescribing drugs using all kinds of data and knowledge is promising for the coming years. From the prescribing, we go uh, in the integrated patient record system. The dispensing system can start now in the pharmacy. The opportunity of an automated dispensing system in well-labeled unit doses is obvious for instance, for traceability and efficient efficiency reasons. But also the safety of the automated pharmacy dispensing system needs an integrated approach. In the patient record system, of course, but also in the automated dispensing systems on the patient care units. Secure access of the specific devices in the patient care units needs to be guaranteed. Only the authorized professional can pick out the right medicine using barcode techniques. We are using such an automated dispensing system on the patient's care units for what we call the fast mover medications for around 80% of the total volume. The other 20% medicines are dispensed direct from the pharmacy. Now, the ad administrating of the medication to the patient can start in the best possible interaction with the patient, of course. In closing the electronic loop of our medication trajectory, we still have to make one step in scanning the patient's identity from his wristband and the specific medicine before administering to the patient. This is our target for the next year, well integrated in the WHO ambitions. So the key aspect of a safe medication trajectory in the integrated system approach, connecting the potential of technologies and, autom and automation. But it needs to go hand in hand with the vital support of professionals. Human error is unfortunately for all of us, every day. Certainly in demanding times and circumstances as in the healthcare today. We therefore need to invest to train our professionals, 
listen to them, caring for them. It takes time and effort. It needs priority from leadership, as leadership is, of course, responsible for the system design. Professionalism is needed, not only in the development process of the system, but also in the implementation and the permanent improvement approach that is needed. You can't do this with high-trained and motivated top professionals. I underlined the role of the structure and the process and the potential of automation, but something more is needed. It's even crucial for success. It's the development of a stimulating culture in an open and learning environment, supporting teamwork and improvement projects in a patient-oriented approach. In such a culture, staff is encouraged to learn from potential and preventable errors to improve safety step by step, every day. The well-described importance of safety culture as part of the integrated approach needs to be underlined. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll continue. Um, thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, speak. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a project lead for safe and efficient pharmaceuticals chain at Uppsala University Hospital, a hospital of 600 beds in the north, northern part of, of uh, Stockholm. Um, I used to be an orthopedic trauma surgeon five years ago, so um, I come from healthcare and do not know a lot about um, medication or automation to begin with. Um, I'm going to talk about the insights from the implementation of automation at our hospital. We are still at the beginning of this journey. Um, besides electronic prescribing, we had nothing when we started, and we are aimed, aiming to implement uh, automatic dispensing cabinets, dose dispensing machines, a closed-loop medication, and also a system-assisted pharmaceutical validation of the prescriptions. So where do we start with all this? Because you can start practically anywhere. My advice uh, would be to start where you get your hands dirty and where you can add value to care uh, directly. Uh, it is a very complex area, so the faster you can fail, uh, the faster you can uh, find your wrongful assumptions, uh, the better. We started with uh, automatic dispensing cabinets because we could uh, easily uh, make a return of investment on those since uh, uh, the handling of narcotics and the documentation was very uh, a very heavy burden uh, for the nurses. Um, also, this gave us the upside to make a lot of connections over the hospital, uh, find many pitfalls, and especially since we aimed at integrating those dispensing cabinets to our prescribing system and also um, to the system that keeps uh, a note on uh, the pharmaceutical articles. Um, so uh, thanks to that project and its many challenges, I would say that it was a very fast way to build a lot of experience. Start little, but get your hands dirty quick. Um, also, um, we took the opportunity to observe work at the wards uh, from a broader perspective uh, at the same time. Um, speaking of, uh, of the wards, it's, um, I can't stress enough the importance to make a careful stakeholder analysis to begin with. Um, you need to be in direct contact with the, the important stakeholders in order to achieve success. And um, that leads me to the second question. How do you approach user experience and change management towards clinical settings and professions? It is extremely challenging in healthcare if you do it the wrong way. Usually you do it the wrong way by making the wrong assumptions and um, don't correct them. One assumption is that healthcare is resilient to change. Uh, this is not really true, though it may seem so. Healthcare is very risk averse, and that means that it always assesses new solutions and changes from a perspective of risks. 95% of all the questions you will get from nurses and doctors will have to do with their uh, risk aversive uh, behavior, and that is how you should interpret it. Critics and critical questions are therefore very valuable for the project. 
Another wrongful assumption is that the interests of staff and patients are in some way conflicting. They really are not, though it may many times seem so because of how the organization is built. Usually how the economical structure is, is designed and so on will make it appear as though staff and uh, bosses are uninterested in patient safety and patient care. But that is not really how it is. Um, you need to be in line with what people want. And we're very lucky with healthcare because people want exactly what, what the patient wants. And um, the professions who work there, they want to be uh, autonomous, they want to be masters at what they're doing, and they want, of course, to work in the direction of an uh, important purpose. So you need to ask yourself with these stakeholders, how is my project lining up with those ambitions? Um, it is actually the authors Jones and Treber, 2018, in an article, wasn't talking about the five rights of medication, but rather the six rights of nurses. And those are the right to enough time to fulfill the tasks and to document, the right workload, the right work environment, the right technology, the right to ask for help, and the right to have an opinion. Um, we should be aware that uh, nurses and doctors, uh, medication systems and automation systems usually are in the periphery of their work. This is not part of their main interests. Um, and sometimes we approach them um, as a stakeholder, but with the wrong interests. They are not primarily interested in economy, compliance to guidelines or criteria for payment, though this is often um, the interest of the project, at least to begin with. We should engage in their problem instead, of course. Um, compare this to a successful business. They will satisfy the right stakeholder and the right need. And the same goes for change management in healthcare, of course. Uh, Tech-driven startups and businesses are usually more unsuccessful than the need-driven ones. And the same will go for these projects. Um, in our project, the main stakeholder is uh, not patients, but nurses. And um, I would like to, to paraphrase uh, Sir Richard Branson here that says, if you take care of the staff, they will take care of the customers. In this, um, in this instance, it's, it's um, uh, the patient. There is, however, ways, of course, to engage the patient. One important one is um, to give them information. Information gives participation and knowledge is power. Just a final word about staff training, that is also the matter. If you want to do a lot of staff training, you don't have the right solution. Nothing should take more than two hours. If it does, then train people who can boil it down to two hours of training, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's really, really helpful. Uh, we're now going to move on to the next section, which is trending towards zero error where I think all panel members are going to make a contribution, but starting with Mike. Thank you, Kieran, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to join this esteemed panel to, to look at this important topic of uh, uh, the challenge really laid out by the uh, World Health Organization to deliver medication without harm. And I just wanted to touch on why this is so important to my company, BD. We've been operating for over 120 years, and BD is one of the top five health technology companies globally. Um, and our purpose is really to advance the world of health. We do have a broad set of solutions and capabilities. Um, and so we do believe we're in a, a really strong position to support health systems in their journey towards a future, um, as, uh, as Johanna said, of, of a fully integrated healthcare environment uh, by providing adv advanced solutions that crosses the entire continuum of care. So from discovery to diagnosis, uh, medication management, and ultimately treatment. So it is a broad portfolio that we have at BD, but our entire focus is really on improving safety and efficiency across health systems. So even when we think about integrated care across the continuum, hospitals clearly will remain uh, an important part and probably at the heart of those systems. But as we've, as we've heard from John, uh, the patient journey is often quite a complex, complex one. So when we think about the hospital of the future, 
and specifically about medication management, probably a good place to start would be what problems are we really trying to solve? What is it that's getting in the way of meeting uh, the World Health Organization challenge? It can't be much of a surprise to any of us that with the extreme pressure of managing through COVID, the, the significant medication management challenges were exposed and, and medication management actually went somewhat awry in circumstances. Research we've done with our customers and other research by experts in the field have demonstrated that today hospitals are facing probably four major medication management challenges. The first one is, is drug shortages. A widely recognized pain point and based on a recent survey, 90% of hospital pharmacists have seen care impacted by this. Shortages in most cases are caused by issues in supply chain, but they're also worsened within the hospital walls because of the lack of systems and software providing reordering and optimization recommendations when stock level is getting low across the hospital. The second challenge is related to waste of expired medicines. The study is mentioning up to 20% of meds discarded each year. In many hospitals, when a drug leaves the pharmacy, it's very difficult and complex for a pharmacist to know when or if it has been used, or when it's going to expire, or if the ward requires replenishment. Pharmacists tell us it actually feels like it's, it's driving in the dark. The third issue and challenge is one connected to inefficiencies within the system, which has been alluded to by, by both Johan and Anders, where clinicians and pharmacy staff are spending up to 30 or 40 percent of their time on non-value added tasks, time that could be better spent on caring for their patients. For example, it's been shown that nurses in a hospital are making up to 400 calls a day to the pharmacy to look for medicines they need. And this is a very apposite point, really, following in the UK yesterday's publication by the Health and Select Committee on staff burnout and staff shortages. Moving now to the, to the final and the fourth challenge, it's related directly to patients and their safety. And the statistics are pretty astonishing, and, and Rachel has alluded to, to much of these. Many of these medications are avoidable. Uh, but they're still happening and in some cases causing harm uh, and death. Um, the, the, the cost, the direct cost, as Rachel said, is about 100 million. But if you add in all the associated costs, it can rise to more like two billion dollars uh, a year. So I guess the question is, why do these challenges still exist in the 21st century? It's true to say that medication management is a complex process with as many as 50 steps involved, and we've heard some of that from, uh, uh, from our contributors today. Hospital departments, technologies and processes invariably are disconnected and not integrated with each other or with the hospital IT systems. And there's lots of manual workarounds that staff have to do to compensate for these disconnected systems. And these manual steps could potentially lead to unintentional mistakes and often harm to patients. So at BD, we have a vision and a set of solutions to simplify and automate this process. We, we've got technologies around the management process in the pharmacy to store and compound, in the ward to store and safely dispense, and at the bedside to safely administer both oral and IV drugs. All of these solutions are connected by software and analytic systems that harness the power of data generated by all of these products. This data is analyzed and processed by highly sophisticated algorithms using artificial intelligence to deliver insights and recommendations. And then with this data, you can detect and mitigate safety risks before they actually reach the patient and drive operational efficiencies to improve the overall management and process workflow from pharmacy to wards. So it sounds expensive, but actually complexity not only creates safety risks, it also is very costly. The automated and connected solutions which I've been describing for the hospital of the future will not only drive safety and improve outcomes, but also drive efficiency and actually has been demonstrated to reduce the overall cost of medication management.
So thank you. And Kieran, I'll hand back to you. Um, let's please go straight on to, 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 to uh, John. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. So we've we've heard a lot about the problem. We've heard some uh, some hints at, at where automation uh, uh, may help, but but and, and other elements as well. So so what what do we do? Well, fundamentally, uh, we have to use a human centered design ap approach, and that means understanding our local systems, understanding where the error points are uh, and where the opportunities are, but understanding how people work. It means understanding local people, their interactions, their interactions with the technology. And it means understanding the local risks. And it then means taking a proactive design approach. But what are the key elements or the key attributes of that design of a, a safe uh, hospital system for, for medication? The first is information. So information that is not just confined to the hospital, but it is across the system of care. So we heard about an electronic patient record, and certainly that helps, but unless it connects to electronic systems outside the hospital or in the patient's care setting, then there will be error. And if we take a good medication reconciliation history, we will find that at least 30% of the medicines on the electronic record are not actually being taken by the patient when they come in into hospital. The electronic monitoring needs to be part of that and the decision support needs to be part of that. So integrated information systems. We need effective teams where doctors, patients and families working together, nurses, pharmacists, engineers, facility design are all working as an effective team so that they know their roles, so they're contributing to design and improvement and, and they're working together to find solutions and learn from when things go wrong and when risks occur. We need reliable processes that are agreed around standard work, uh, that are audited and monitored, uh, and, and that are also adaptive uh, when, when necessary. But they need to be designed locally uh, to, 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 to meet the local system. And then we need a learning approach so that when error or harm occurs or when risk is identified, we've got feedback loops within that, that uh, uh, effective team and the organization is supporting those learning loops in order to make change to our systems and processes so they can become more reliable. And fundamentally, we need a risk approach so that we're looking forwards and we're asking the question, what could possibly go wrong? And then we're uh, putting systems in place that might reduce the chance of that going wrong. But we won't have a perfect system. And we also need to ask, ask the question, what is an acceptable level of risk at which we're prepared to design the system around and at which we uh, need to be alert and, and able to be adaptive? So fundamentally, local people need to design the solutions. Technology has its part to play, uh, but that needs to be implemented locally to be locally uh, effective. I'll hand on uh, back to Anders, I think. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, what is uh, the assumption that, that at least I make is that, that um, trending towards zero error, one, one important way of, of achieving this is uh, successful solutions in automation and digitalization. But how do you really achieve it? Um, we know that the new technology is a double-edged sword. You can cut into failure or success. The Standish Group does its yearly surveys, and uh, they have seen for the last 10 or 20 years or so that most projects fail. We can also see that productivity in healthcare plummets um, at the same time that we are implementing more and more digital systems. We have around 800 of them at our hospitals. But this can be achieved if you do it the right way. You need to weld together two important factors in the right way. One is the human factor. The human factor is adaptable, able to improvise and develop, but it's also error prone and perhaps with somewhat an attitude. Though you shouldn't blame culture, that is a classic pitfall, I would say. If you're having the term, of, if you blame workplace culture, it's usually just a translation of that you haven't under, really understood what it's all about. 
the second factor is the technological factor. Um, it does what it's told without any errors, but it's not able to adapt. It's not able to improvise or uh, change with changing workflows and situations. If you appreciate both these factors and their strength and their weaknesses and put them together, then you're on the path to success. Uh, so firstly, what you do is you find the user experience experts and not just any experts, but those who are experts in the professional systems. As John mentioned, um, a human centered approach to development. Then you usually need some kind of requirements engineer who can formulate the perfect requirements for your new solutions. And also a systems architect has proven very useful, at least in our project. Then you start by doing a thorough stakeholder analysis for the reasons I previously mentioned. Um, and those, the most important stakeholders and the primary stakeholders, you study their work. And um, um, in this case, it's nurses and to some extent also pharmacists. Uh, what you should perform here is a so-called contextual analysis. Um, and I can strongly recommend uh, a book by Karen Holtzblatt in the first edition that is called Rapid Contextual Design um, in this matter. Um, from this analysis, you can create models of how the work is performed today. And you can also list the associated problems and where in the different workflows those problems are situated. You can also make models not only of the work sequences, but also of the physical environment, uh, cultural models, and also information flow models. Um, then you start to create solutions and see will these solutions cure the problems that we mapped up in these different diagrams and models that we made. And throughout, you of course need to validate the needs that you formulate and also the requirements that you formulate. And a requirements engineer is brilliant to use in this work uh, rather than doing it yourself. Uh, then when you're finished, um, you have an information model you have use cases that describe the common use cases and also the critical use cases. And also you should define important exceptions. Uh, you have a, a list of requirements. Um, for more advanced uh, projects, you should also um, make some kind of prototype to show uh, the company or those you work with what you, the solution you, you see, uh, what you think it should look like. And also you need an evaluation model to describe how will we evaluate these different solutions when we try to uh, either procure them or, or develop them. Thank you. Sorry, on, on, on mute. Uh, I think we should go to Johan next, please. Thank you. I, I would um, make a reflection from the COVID-19 uh, perspective in uh, this session. Um, the COVID-19 impact in our hospital was uh, overwhelming. And, and um, it was a quite tough period for all of us in our, in our hospital. But it was also a period when we developed a new spirit in our hospital uh, with a focus towards our internal staff, but also focusing on working together with um, the outside uh, care deliverers. By doing so, we created a new connection with primary care fo centers, focusing on the COVID-19 screening and now vaccination. But we also discovered new opportunities in working together with the local communities and new facilities in connecting with our patients. Perhaps too long, hospitals were the center of care. But the evolving patient care needs require new approaches and new care models. We think that the concept of integrated care is more than promising, and hospitals will evolve to new partnerships with primary care and other facilities. This evolution, this perspective, has of course also impact on the medication trajectory. 
As I underlined earlier, the important role of integration in the hospital, the integration's perspective will also be vital in the new care models that will be developed in the future. So prescribing, dispensing and administering medication will grow outside the hospital, but it is far more difficult to develop the needed system approach. We see the advantage of clinical pharmacy working on emergency units when patients arrive, using an electronic connection with the home medication of the patient. We see the importance of electronic communication with and access towards the electronic patient record for the primary care physicians. It's promising that they're the first signs of more integrated care. But our healthcare system is still fragmented in different ways. And so integration and developing a system approach is, remains challenging. Transformation of the healthcare system is therefore needed. The COVID-19 pandemic can be a turning point for this transformation, triggered by the evolving healthcare needs of patients in the future. It would be interesting and promising, I think, that we could develop a business case for safe medication system. When we take the quality and safety dimensions of the well-known IOM uh, framework, effective, efficient, timely, patient-centered, equitable, and safe, that would be a very interesting starting point and the medication trajectory uh, of the patient as the objective. I'm strongly convinced, and we can see it in our daily practice in this hospital, that we can improve on effectiveness, efficiency, and waste, as uh, Mike earlier said, and safety. Also, here is no lack of recommendation for good research, but the implementation of those recommendations in a fragmented environment remains challenging. It's a big appeal towards leadership, leadership and, new, uh, uh, and, and developing a new, more integrated healthcare system. We can discuss this later on, but for me, integration is the key message, and so more integrated care Will, be provi will provide us new perspect perspectives towards medication safety. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. And um, uh, I, I guess I'd like to put a broader industry pers perspective and what is the role of industry in uh, all of this, all of this move. And uh, uh, as uh, Kieran mentioned earlier, I'm actually on the board of ABHI, which is the leading association uh, and the leading voice for the health technology industry in the UK. Um, there are over 4,000 health technology companies in the UK and employ over 130,000 people uh, and generate about uh, 25 billion in, in, in revenues. Um, so it, it's, it's a big group. And uh, I guess, um, I'll make apologies at the risk of alienating half our international audience today. I'll answer the, the question about the role of industry with a UK focus. Uh, but actually at the heart of uh, the changes that are happening within the NHS are, are what Johan referred to, which is this drive towards integrated care systems. And I think uh, the experience of the pandemic suggests that uh, there's an acceleration towards these integrated care organisations. So intuitively, that move should break down silos between primary, secondary care and ways of working uh, and also budgets. Uh, and this in the past has been a, a persistent and significant barrier to the adoption of new technologies, uh, like the ones we've been talking about today, as Johan said, a safe medication system across the continuum. How do you actually go about uh, uh, making that, uh, putting that in place? Um, Procurement is uh, sometimes seen as a bit of a dark cloud on all of this to make it all happen. And in the UK, at least, the government is currently consulting on public procurement. Um, procurement can't simply be about acquisition cost savings. It must provide the system with a true value-based offer, considering the full benefits of technology in the longer term, uh, and also uh, for health security, sustainability of supply. 
And value is about delivering the best outcomes that matter to patients within the money that's available in the budget. And to achieve this, in the words of uh, Professor Hamish Lang, who's director of the value-based Health and Care Academy at Swansea University, both industry and the health system and the NHS need to show up in a different way. NHS procurement have traditionally been quite risk averse and so tended to focus on transactional relationships really with suppliers, where the focus all too often is on price and not value. Uh, and indeed, the current model we have in the UK, uh, current operating model in England, uh, with category towers is designed to really support that approach. It's great for the less or the more commoditized products to get the best price for the NHS, but when you're looking to facilitate the uptake of innovative solutions that uh, Johan's talked about, uh, like connected medication management, clearly this model isn't going to, to work. I'm pleased to say that model is being reviewed at the moment and I'm hoping that the new targeted operating model will provide greater support to, to support the adoption of innovation. Industry though, for its part, uh, may have been too focused on their own products and shorter term gains. So both industry and the NHS need to uh, look through a longer term lens to develop trusting multi-year partnerships. And to build trust, industry needs to invest time and resource in truly understanding the needs of health uh, organizations, NHS organizations. And if we took the example of medication management, and for want of a better word, maybe it should start with a consultancy approach to really understand the current process that exists and to identifying all the pain points and mapping out those moments of risk. This then provides a basis to co-create solutions to address the suboptimal steps in the system. And then when it comes to procurement, the healthcare organization will be in a position to specify exactly what is required to deliver the best outcomes for patients, and then instruct procurement to go off and identify suppliers who can meet those specifications, uh, and then do the best deal to, to deliver that within the budget. Now, these solutions are likely to include multiple products and services, and it's unlikely that one supplier will be able to provide all elements of the solution. So as suppliers, we'll need to think flexibly in how we respond to the tenders that would come out in response to these. And models do exist today for this uh, approach. Uh, an example is managed equipment service contracts. And these are quite good because uh, these types of arrangements do build in the opportunity to share the risks between partners and build outcomes that matter into the contracts that they reach. But to get there will require change from uh, NHS, other health systems and the industry to be more transparent with data sharing. Uh, ov obviously, we need to respect uh, data privacy laws. However, to gain true power of the inter interoperable solutions that Anders and Johan have spoken about, we do need to embrace the process of turning anonymized patient data into actionable intelligence, a point that John related to as well. If we all focus on the shared goal of getting the best outcome for patients, I'm sure this is possible. Uh, and we've heard the COVID pandemic has shown that when there is an urgent and shared goal partnership between government, NHS and industry can truly deliver extraordinary results. So my hope is that we can retain this. Don't let things slip back to the status quo uh, when the crisis is over. So thank you. And uh, Kieran, uh, or I think it's Rachel, back to you. Thank you very much. Um, I've, I've listened with great interest um, to the uh, speakers in this section. Um, and um, my sort of job, I think, is to is to think about the the um, the data needs for um, for how we we hit the target. You know, how, how do we how do we know when we've been successful? I mean, we, we seem to have quite a big ask here. We want solutions that are needs driven, not technology driven, which is which is great, which is um, uh, music to my ears. I spend a lot of time evaluating uh, technologies and some of the digital technologies that have come through before and during COVID have been more technology driven than needs driven. 
this intervention, these, these solutions need to be implementable. They need to be aligning with what people want and what they can do. They need to focus on the key users of the technology, you know, which might be nurses or pharmacists, for example. They need to come out within a budget. They need to be future proofed. They need to allow us to trend towards zero errors and they need to um, somehow um, bridge that um, that transition from primary to secondary care as well. And this all needs to happen in a healthcare system that is resistant to change, that does not have interoperable systems. So this is quite a big ask um, to demonstrate um, that, to de develop and demonstrate the effectiveness and um, efficiency of these systems. And, 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 I, and I picked up on the use of the phraseology of value-based offer, not just acquisition costs. And of course, from a health economics perspective, that's, that talks about, well, how much does it cost to, to, to um, implement the system but then what are we getting back in terms of benefits and what are those benefits so you've got your you know how do we measure that this is a successful system so what value are we getting from this system so obviously the first thing to do is think well are, are the error rates going down so do we have the ability to measure the errors um, that are happening that we want to change um, before the before the system is implemented so that we can then measure them afterwards to see if we have been successful in reducing errors and and are we actually reducing the right errors are we reducing errors that matter so for example in administration of medicines about 70 percent of administration errors are actually um classed to be not clinically important so you know they happen that you know the drug is given at the wrong time or for example but clinically it probably doesn't matter to the patient so should we be developing interventions that focus only on those errors where we know there is a, is a risk for harm but then also we've got to think about whether we can actually record the data it's relatively easy in primary care to record prescribing errors because all the prescribing is electronic in the UK, for example. If you start to look at um, trying to record administration errors using routine data, not observational studies or research, it becomes more difficult. So just simply understanding what the baseline error rates are and then knowing whether we've improved that or not is is, is actually um, not always that straightforward in every system and will be different a different challenge for different systems and are we interested in errors like i say some errors are important some aren't should we be measuring things that are more important in terms of budgets or in terms of patient outcomes so length of stay you know can we link our administration error data then to that patient's length of stay and or do we, are we saying, well, we want to reduce the numbers of bleeds or the number of VTEs, for example, um, using our system? And are we able to link that data? So th there's, a, there's a whole number of challenges in terms of designing these interventions, but there's also um, a whole set of challenges in terms of um, having the data to be able to demonstrate that success or not and then to be able to turn that into this value-based offer that, um, that we've, we've been talking about. So we're not just talking about the acquisition costs of a system. We are saying, well, you know, if you invest in this system, then actually what will happen down the line is you will reduce error rates in these particular errors, areas, but actually those, by reducing those errors, you will improve um, the, the processes of care, it's such that length of stay is reduced, for example, or you reduce avoidable um, mortality within hospital, or you reduce unwanted or unnecessary readmissions. And, um, and these are just some of the sort of the beginnings of, of um, some of the questions that we need to answer in order to be able to sort of close the loop on whether by introducing these technologies, implementing them and using them, we will then lead to this 50 percent reduction in harm from uh, medication errors that has been um, asked for by the World Health Organization. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. That's really helpful. And, and thanks to all panel members who've contributed thus far. Um, I'd ask all panel members to now switch their video back on uh, as we move to the question and answer uh, section. And 
and, and to the audience, please do add further questions. We've got a good few questions in already, but we welcome more. Um, but let's start off with a question for Anders, please. Anders, how quickly did you benefit from the technology adoption? What were the biggest benefits? And what did you learn about how best to introduce technology to staff? So uh, our main experience comes from dispensing cabinets. I would say it's a fairly simple and very established technology. Um, it was very, uh, it was a very unsurprising experience since we had done time studies um, before and and um, after. It, it is uh, very hard to measure the benefits in in purely economical terms. Um, so, so what we did instead was to um, to see. Uh, to, to just sort of count the benefits up to the, the point that we can say, yes, we can have a good return on this investment. Um, it's very difficult to, to specify it more than that, I'm afraid. And part of this project is actually also to uh, provide, uh, well, opportunity for, for key performance indicators since we don't have them or, or we can't measure them at the moment. Was that the answer to the question or did I drift off? You know, I, I, I think it does. Just one follow-up question related to that. What surprised you about the process of, of technology adoption, if, if anything? Um, the complexity for uh, integration between systems. It is uh, many, many hurdles. You have the logics of two systems and you also have the logic of the language uh, between those systems. Everyone told me that it is complex, but you really need to experience it. I would say that was the, the biggest hurdle um, to, to overwin, and we are still struggling with it. So if you're aiming for integrations, keep it really simple and know that you're really benefiting from it. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. Please, anybody can chip in to answer any of these questions. Uh, in the context of cybersecurity concerns, has anyone undertaken an assessment of the risk, ex risk exposures in that respect, given the direction of travel towards increased digitalization and automation? Who wants to take that one? I can maybe just comment from a, from a BD perspective. I, and I'll have to admit upfront, I don't know the details, but you know, clearly given our solutions do depend heavily on software and uh, integration with, with, with other systems, cybersecurity is a major, major priority for us. So we have, we have a whole team looking at, looking at that to make sure uh, with our systems that they uh, comply and uh, are able to, uh, uh, to provide the utmost security to, uh, to our customers and their health systems. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not an expert, so I don't know the detail uh, behind that, Kieran. Thank you. Anybody else want to add in any further thoughts on cybersecurity? Just a short comment. We, we got help from our IT experts. Um, so they have uh, actually developed a checklist uh, from GDPR and the Schrems uh, to um, case and so on. So so we are able to check our project and the and take requirements from from um, from this checklist okay thank you there was another point comment slash question on closed loop medication and the the, the person was commenting that a lot a lot of staff training is is needed or was needed i wonder is that the case or is there a way of doing that more efficiently or or is uh, and a large amount of staff training needed for for this. Once again, anybody can have a go at this, please. Well, I can start off. <laughs> Closed loop medication in the meaning to have a bedside verification of medication administration is is the biggest challenge, at, at least in, in uh, from my perspective. It's incredibly difficult and we are meddling with the situation between the nurse and the patient in the patient room, which is a very sensitive situation, so to speak. So um, um, I would advise, I, I wouldn't say that there's a universal solution other than 
that if you need a lot of staff training, you're probably on the wrong way. Uh, start early and start development from, from the beginning, actually. Even though there are ready solutions, be sure to also try to develop your own, your own concept. And if, if you need a human-centered approach anywhere, it's here. Okay, thank you. And a, a related question on a similar theme. Why can't we standardize a software nationally as this heavily impacts training needs every time we move from one hospital to another? I'm guessing that, that probably comes from a, a, a junior doctor. Um, who wants to take that one about standardizing a software nationally? John. I, I think this is a this is a key issue. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's possible uh, or it's a, it's a big challenge to standardise software uh, nationally, as as we know from the National Programme for IT that, that originally tried to do that in a number of areas. But there are uh, ways in which we could have specifications for software so that it is when it is used by people in different institutions, the user interface is similar or the same. That does require a national joined up approach of multiple organizations. It requires a, 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 the right sort of partnership uh, with industry as, be, as has been alluded to during, during, this, during this discussion and that open design uh, approach. Uh, it needs, uh, in a UK perspective, you know, the NHS to be prepared to be clear on specifications. But the biggest uh, gap, for example, at the moment in terms of, uh, of of, of joined up medication information across the, across the healthcare system is is because we don't have a common language in medicines. So there's a big piece of work being led by NHSX on interoperable medicines. But probably the biggest uh, barrier to that is that uh, hospitals are not using the same uh, electronic language for medicines as primary care is, and that's what's obstructing this. And so until we get that, then whatever our technology partners do, uh, we won't be able to have that flow of, of information for safer care. So in summary, um, from a professional point of view, we would certainly want uh, similar user interfaces in, 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 in each organisation. It's not always down to the software. It's, it's very commonly down to the local implementation of the, and the local implementation of that software and how it's adapted locally. So it not only needs the software companies to do it, but it needs local teams to be following the same process in terms of implementation and usage. And then the training training can be aligned. Thank you. I, I wonder, does anybody else want to come in on this particular point, which, which seems to be an important one, standardizing the software nationally? I can only endorse what John has said, actually, from an industry side of things. It's, um, you know, if we can standardize specification, uh, I think that will that will help. Uh, and we can do that through co-creation and, and working with uh, with health partners to, to do that. But uh, John has highlighted, you know, when you're looking to try and look, how do you implement, uh, let's say, medication management across the continuum, you need hospital to be talking to primary care. And I know in, in some areas within uh, uh, within Scandinavia, for example, within Sweden, I know that 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 happens. But in the NHS, it's been a bit of a um, bit of a holy grail that we've been trying to, to 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 grab. And I think that will definitely be a really good facilitator of all of this. There are workarounds for sure, but um, uh, it'd be better if if we could uh, try and standardise across. Thank you very much, Mike and John. Let's move back to Anders, another question, Anders. I wonder how long did it take for clinicians to become familiar and comfortable with the new technology? And could this be accelerated? Um, well, I would uh, comment on when we implemented the, the e-prescribing uh, system. Um, it took some time, mainly because that system didn't support the workflow of the clinician, um, actually. Are there ways to improve this? Um, yes, there is. Um, the implementation was facilitated. Um, well, we did one large change to the prescribing system, and it was planned to, um, to be rolled out with the help of e-learning. 
uh, I would strongly recommend to avoid using e-learning. Instead, we trained other fellow clinicians to be trainers themselves and then train their colleagues in this system. And we came down to the to the sort of a magic two hour limit, uh, never exceed the two hour limit of training. <laughs> that is one law. The other, the other thing is clinicians aren't that interested in digital systems, of course, they are interested in prescribing and doing their work. So when it comes to this kind of training, think of it as a cup that only holds a certain volume of knowledge. And there is no need to keep on pouring if the cup is full. And if you still have things to pour, you need to, to spill it out and put it somewhere else. So, so that is actually the key. See how well it conforms to their key pr work processes. And the less it does, um, the less interested they will be. And you need to have a more and more condensed uh, learning material. Or you need to be better to explain to them why do we need this, even though we're not interested in it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, let's move on to another question. Uh, instead of disparate applications that need to integrate with each other, is it feasible to have a more data-centric approach, i.e. a big data lake with an AI-driven front end to enable prescription safety, etc.? Who wants to take that one? I can make a small comment, at least, sorry, sorry, it's only me speaking. Um, well, after speaking with people in the know, one great supporter has been um, a retired professor who has been uh, working with IT and healthcare since the 80s. And um, after careful consideration, he would recommend that, uh, just exactly that, that we need to go to uh, a safe data storage and uh, a somewhat standardized exchange of data but then a very sort of free world when it comes to the applications and the programs using this data. That is definitely the future, um, but it's, it's a matter of long time, of course. I think we're moving away from those big monolithic systems that are very hard to integrate with each other to instead having the care provider storing the data, but then companies and services and clinicians can actually build their own apps and software as long as they're up to the security and safety standards. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrews. Anybody else on the data-driven approach? Mike, sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. If any. No, and I, I'd agree agree with Anders there. And I think uh, you know areas that uh, uh, we've been developing is is kind of middleware really uh, that can integrate these um, disparate uh, programs into a central um, uh, database, if you like, that can then be used. That is just data. What you then need to do is to be able to analyze that to, to give you the insights that you need to, to improve safety. So we, we've certainly invested a lot in our research and development in, in that middleware type, uh, uh, type package. That can link then to any uh, hospital electronic IT system. Uh, but that that middleware is actually the the, the one place of, of of repository, if you like, of the data from those those disparate systems. So really support what the questioner has uh, is really driving it. Great, thank you, thanks, Mike. Let's move on to another question. How do you build? And I think this one is probably most appropriate for for Johan. Uh, how do you build an impactful business case? for the automation of medication in the context of competing investments in the hospital? Yes, that's an, uh, an interesting question. Um, I can, um, I can ref make some reflections from our own journey. Um, we developed an integrated system uh, four years ago. Um, it took two years to prepare it. Um, and to, to think about it, uh, to reflect on it. Um, and every part of the system, the prescribing system, the dispensing system, it was all uh, well thought of. It's, it's a whole, it's a project. You can calculate the costs of that uh, project. And I will give an example. By uh, integrating uh, our system, um, the, the waste of medicine was uh, reduced by more than 30%. Uh, 
be before that that we had our integrated uh, system um, when we see that uh, another example um, making phone calls to the pharmacy was spectacularly reduced uh, all the information is in the system you it's integrated and the waste not only focusing on medicine but also on um, time for nurses time for doctors was also uh, Im improved so when we are uh, making the roundup of our business case yes of course you need to invest and eh? that's that's for sure but uh, and we don't have all calculated in detail of course but i think everybody in our in our organization and we are it's a big hospital with 4000 uh, staff everybody is ag agreed that it was a tough period it's not easy to implement it but it was worth the cost in doing so and we are now doing the first studies uh, measuring the, the, the impact of focusing on patient safety. I, I give the example of the clinical pharmacy. As, the, as a result of all the integration, the clinical pharmacy can, can make far more faster connections with the physicians and our, the, the potential adverse uh, drug events are detected I almost immediately. So I think, um, when we could make uh, those business cases with other organizations, yeah, I think it, it's we can we can improve on efficiency, on effectivity, and on patient safety. Thank, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to another question: Is it possible to break the taboo of medication errors? Many hospitals believe there there aren't any, even though there must be. How can you change the culture? to speak openly and that's we'll open that up to anybody well i i did a little i did a little bit of research focusing on patient safety culture um, i think most important is uh, the example of leadership um, leadership has to create an open learning environment um, and and uh, when leadership can create that culture um, it will spread away and it and leadership needs to be consequent on focusing on the patient safety culture when we are analyzing incidents it's almost making a balance sense reason is calling it a just culture you must make a balance uh, of course something went wrong and it's serious we need to investigate it but because to where is human we all are convinced that we need to improve the system and not blaming the, the individuals and and i think that's that's the most far um uh, challenge for for leadership is building creating an, an an inspiring motivating culture a safety culture every day thank you who else wants to come in on this here and I, might, I might i might comment on that uh, i i think that um i think fundamental to this is is frontline staff working together collaboratively seeing uh, patient safety and medication safety as a, as a multi-professional uh, um, responsibility um, so for every every medication error that's reported in the re in a reporting system there will be many tens of potential errors and and and, uh, and even small errors that are detected at a clinical level at a ward level maybe by the nurse maybe by the doctor maybe by the pharmacist maybe by the patient uh, and the interaction between those staff is key. And I would absolutely echo what's just been said around leadership. So uh, that's joint leadership there of uh, you know, medical, nursing, pharmacy staff at, at the ward level to, be, to show that openness that when uh, error or potential error is detected, then it's not about blame, but it's about learning. It's about helping each other to do the right thing for the patients, being about open with the patient. So leadership at the team level, as well as the organizational level and, and multi-professional responsibility for medication safety, for learning and safer practice. Thank you. And I know we're running out of time, but I want to answer all questions if we can. Uh, question for Rachel or anyone. This talk is very interesting, but the issues and solutions we're chatting about have been chatted about as long as I can remember. What disruption can we introduce to accelerate change? Rachel, do you want to have a go at that or 
anybody else can also. Well, I mean, I mean, as a health economist, then um, I think we should be focusing. I mean, what there's been a lot of talk today about systems and technologies, but what we haven't been talking about very much is reducing harm. Um, and so, really, we need to be focusing on exactly what it is we want to achieve with these systems. Um, we have a reporting learning system, uh, incident reporting system, um, to help um, staff to uh, learn from um, errors. Um, we know that most people don't actually report their, their, um, their incidents. I mean, you have four levels, really. You've got the system of no, no error, uh, sorry, and, uh, you've got the system where you, you don't believe it's an incident and then you've got the system where you think it's an incident but you don't want to tell anybody because you're worried about being blamed. Then you've got the set, the third level where you, it's discussed with your colleagues and then you decide not to submit it as an incident and then you've got the fourth level where you've got the actual um, error that gets submitted um, as an incident. So so learning systems um, um, are are notoriously underutilized, but they do give us some ideas about what are incidents. But really, um, we need to be focusing on ha on harm, um, not on we what we think is important, but on, on actual harm. And until we get data on the harm, on the value of reducing errors, then we're, we're just going to carry on going round and round in, in, in circles. Um, I do think um, there have been some interesting questions today. You know, I think, the, you know, there's some great ideas about, you know, having a data lake, but, you know, what about, you know, anonymity, GDPR, lack of interoperability, you know, this, we've got to be practical. Um, and what things do we know have actually worked in a particular context, and could that be rolled out or made bigger somewhere else? Um, and you know, we can't we can't keep talking in generalities. That's what I think. As as a health economist, we actually have to roll our sleeves up and take some of the solutions that we know work and make them work better or more widely and stop doing things that don't work. But we need to think about why it is we're actually trying to reduce errors. Are we trying to save money? Are we trying to improve patient trust? Are we trying to improve health? What, what is it we're trying to do and focus on what we're actually trying to achieve? Thanks very much, uh, Rachel. I know we're running desperately over now, um, but if any, anybody else has any further comments on, on, on that point or on any of the other points made so far? Just a, just a quick point, Kieran, if I may, and building on what, what Rachel said, excellent, excellent points there. I think you can have all the technology in the world, but then, you know, as Anders and, and Johan have alluded to, it's about implementation. And I think, you know, I, I would say we, we've maybe underestimated the change management required to implement these systems. Um, it, it really needs probably more focus to do that. We're asking people to do things differently that they've been used to for, for many years and we need to support that that change I think to uh, make sure these technologies are adopted. Thank you. Um, Andrews, yes. Just uh, might I just add that the second that uh, patient harm will be associated with costs uh, the work will will accelerate. Sure that's a very succinct and and good point and probably a good one to end it on so time is up already thank you very much to the team to the panel members of course to Beckton dickinson and thanks most of all to you for attending and taking part and asking such good questions we'll make the recording live on the site in the next uh, in, in, in the next couple of days, potentially within the next 24 hours. Um, so thank you very much indeed for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you. <laughs>